Okay, so we are again talking about hybridization, which is the combination of two or more orbitals, right, that kind of smush themselves together to make a new orbital. So as we're looking at this molecule, CH4, what's the molecular geometry of CH4? Yeah, Macy, what do you think? Tetrahedral, tetrahedral good. Okay, tetrahedral. That means each of those hydrogens have oriented themselves around the carbon to be about 109.5 degrees apart. Okay, so that's the farthest apart they can sit um, and still be kind of happy in terms of their repulsion um, of those electron pockets, right, those orbitals. So it has the tetrahedral geometry, which means it has four equal electron orbitals. But how is that possible, right? If you look at carbon itself, carbon is in what block? The 1s, the 2s, the 2p, 3s, what is it? Do you remember? The 2p, right? Second level or second row, and it's in the p block. So car carbon is in the 2p orbitals, okay? Hydrogen is each in the what orbital? 1s, right? So how does that work? We've got two on different levels. They're different shapes. How does that work, okay? Carbon has four valence electrons that it is available to give, Okay, two of those electrons are in the 2s orbitals, and two of those electrons are in the 2p orbitals. Okay, so let's look at carbon. Carbon has four valence electrons, right? All of those valence electrons are in its outermost shell, which is the s, or sorry, the second level, right? Are we clear on that part so far? Okay, carbon has four to give. Two of those are found in the 2s orbital. Two of them are found in the p orbitals. The s orbitals and the p orbitals have different shapes. Do, you, do we remember looking at those shapes a little bit? What's the shape of an s orbital? Just a circle, right? And what's the shape of a p orbital? Yeah, like an hourglass or kind of like a little dumbbell around, the, um, around that central atom, okay? So the s orbitals and the p orbitals have different shapes. So if it has four electrons to give... Yet, we know it's tetrahedral, which has four completely um, identical electron orbitals. How does that work, right? We need equal energy orbitals or equal energy since it's a tetrahedral molecule. So what we're doing is we're going to combine those s orbitals and those p orbitals into one called a hybrid orbital, okay? Into each of these hybrid orbitals, Okay. And I'm, I'm not concerned with what the new shape is, but it has a new name. Okay. Rather than S orbitals and P orbitals, we call this an SP3 orbital. SP3 orbitals. Okay, and I'm going to give you a few more rules to go with this, and we'll look through more examples that will make hopefully a little bit more sense. But this is the introduction to how we get there. Okay, Carbon has four things bonded around it, and they are called now sp3 orbital. So instead of having two electrons in an s orbital, two electrons in a p orbital, it's got an electron in each of those sp3 orbitals surrounding it. Okay. I know this is still a little new. I know this is still... Yes, I can. I'm sorry. Okay, just stay with me and we will get to where we need to be, I promise. Oh, you want me to go back to not a blank screen? Okay. Okay, so let me give you one kind of clue here as to why we call it an sp3 orbital. Okay, sp3. If I count s, p1, p2, p3, right, how many is that? s, p1, p2, p3. Four. How many things was carbon bonded to? Four. s, p1, p2, p3. Okay, so those total number of electron domains or total number of bonds will kind of help us determine if it's called an sp orbital or an sp2 orbital or an sp3 orbital, right? And then it can keep going off of that. But I'll show you the pattern that you'll be able to kind of pick up and to name those new <coughs> hybrid orbitals. Okay, we can predict the molecule's hybridization or the new types of orbitals by the number of domains. Okay, this is what I was just kind of talking about. We had new carbon was bonded to four things. So it's an S, P, P2, and P3, okay? So for example, we talked about CH4 had four domains, which gives it an S, P3. Sorry, I don't want to get ahead of it too much here.
Okay, we can also determine our hybridization just by our molecular geometry shape. So I'm going to give you a table that kind of tells us um, this is the domains, this is the shape, and this is the new hybrid orbitals that we would form off of that. You can use either one of those to kind of help you remember the shapes or the names of the new orbitals, right? These new hybrid orbitals that have formed. Um, but I, I really think it's easier to go with the domain category. Count the domains, and then you can kind of count out what this new orbital would be called. Okay, so tetrahedral means it's an sp3 orbital as well. Remember this sp3 is just kind of the new names of that new orbital shapes. Okay, so here is where we can see a connection a little bit more, okay? So I want to talk through it a little bit, and then I will give you plenty of time to write down this table. So let me explain it first just a little bit, okay? If I have two domains... That means I've got two things bonded to it, or even a lone pair and one bond, whatever it is. I've got two pockets of electrons surrounding that central atom, okay? That means I've got some out of an S orbital, some out of a P orbital, okay? So all that we're doing is meshing those two together, and we call it an SP orbital, okay? So that's one, one domain, two domains, right? That would give us a linear molecule. If I had three domains, what are my possible shapes for a three-domain type molecule? Look on your molecular geometry sheet. Trigonal planar or bent, right? Three domains give us sp2, right? S, sp, sp2. Okay, you can kind of count your way up. So if I have four total domains, I'm going to say s, sp, sp2, sp3, right? Do we see how we're counting our way toward those new shapes? Kind of. Okay. From there, we start to add in the d orbitals, okay? So now if we've got five total domains, we say sp3, d, which gives us a total of five, right? s, sp, sp2, sp3, and then we add that d orbital, okay? This is the most we'll go up to is this sp3, d2. So that's a really, really big molecule that that central atom has to have lots of room around it to keep um, those electrons in place, okay? Go ahead and get this table written down, and then I'll continue to answer questions if we have any. You don't have to necessarily write down the, sh the molecular geometry that goes with it. That's totally up to you. I think this method is a little bit simpler, but, you know, that's totally up to you. This is NH3. This has a total of four domains, right? Three bonding, three bonding, and one non-bonding. So four total domains, right? Domains are pockets of electrons around that atom. Okay, so we've got four total. So what would be our um, molecular geometry here? Trigonal pyramid, that's right. Trigonal pyramid, because we've got four bond, four domains, but one lone pair. So we've got to move over <coughs> one of those sections on our table. Does that make sense? Four total domains, one lone pair. Um, let's look at our hybridization chart now. Okay, if we've got four domains, what does the hybridization of that central atom have to be? SP3. Okay. Is that part, that counting up part, making sense, or are you just looking at your table? I'm just looking at the table. Okay. I want you to get to the point where you can do it without the table. Okay? And I, I understand this seems really abstract, and it's hard to kind of grasp the reality of what we're doing here. Okay? But I want you to be able to start counting those domains and helping you realize what goes with that. Okay? So do any of you have questions about why it stops in, and it doesn't go S2, S3, and, or, or P4, P5, P6? Is anyone wondering about that part of it? Yeah, why well, is it only S4? Okay, so how many electrons can the S orbital hold? Two. It can hold two, right? And there's only one type of S orbital because it can only hold two electrons, okay? There's only one type of S orbital. How many electrons can the P block hold? It can hold six, but how many um, electrons can be in each orbital? Two. two, okay? So that means how many types of P orbitals are there? Three. There are three right? Three types of p orbitals. So there's one type of s orbital. There's three types of p orbitals. That's why we say s, 
and then P1, P2, or P3, right? It's kind of talking about how many of those different types of P orbitals are we having to pull in there, okay? Does that make sense? And then the D orbitals, theoretically, how many different types of D orbitals could there be? Five. There could be five. We only go up to two, right? We only look at the hybridization up to using two of those types. Does that kind of make more sense? A little bit? Okay, what other questions do you have about that um, counting up method? What do you, what do you count to? Okay, so if we had another molecule that just had two things around it, two total domains, we would just say SP. Okay, two domains would be SP. If we had three domains, we'd say S, SP, <coughs> SP2. Right, we can just count our way up through that. Okay, here we have four things, so we say S, SP, SP2, SP3. All right, so you have to just kind of count your way through that table, but I want you to be able to do it uh, kind of on your own without looking at the table, hopefully. Make a little bit more sense? Okay, what's the shape that goes with this? What did we say? Trigonal, Trigonal pyramid. Does that match on your um, table as well? Trigonal pyramid is one of our options for SP3? Okay, so we can do it that way too. I think that's a little bit more of a memorization tactic than an understanding tactic, so... Um, you know, that's up to you, but I'd probably go with our domain method. Okay, for each of the following, give the molecular geometry and identify the hybridization orbitals. Okay, so I want you to give the geometry as well as the hybridization, so S or SP or whatever it is. Okay, um, let's start with just one for now. SO2. Have to start with the Lewis structure. Total domains do we have here? Three. Three, right? Each a double bond still only counts as one domain. So we have one, two, three domains. So if we count, it would go S, SP, SP2. Okay, is that what we all had for our molecular? I'm sorry, for our hybridization, hopefully? Okay, what'd you have instead? Bent. Is that one of the possibilities for SP2? Okay, very good. SP2, any questions about how we got to SP2? Three domains, right? S, then SP, then SP2. So that's where we finish. Okay, ready to do a couple on your own? Let's try CI4, that's not CL4, that's CI4, and BCL3. I know those are really hard to see the difference. Okay, so chloride tetraiodide and then boron trichloride. Okay. Intermolecular forces, forces that hold molecules together, right? The forces that keep solids as solids and liquids as liquids, right? Not as gases or whatever. Okay, so these are between. You might want to like you know make a little underline there, not within molecules. What are the forces called that are within molecules that hold atoms to each other? Okay, they would be called intra. Okay, but I mean more specifically, what have we been talking about this whole chapter? Bonds. Good. Bonds. Okay. Okay, so I want you to think of, you don't have to write this part down. Okay, you, I know you guys like want to write every little single thing that comes out of my mouth. Okay, you don't have to write this part down. Okay. Think about what happens when something melts. What has to happen for something to become a solid to a liquid? You need heat. What does the heat do, though? <laughs> okay, it melts it. More specific, let's think on a molecular level here. That's right, it will start to break the bonds between molecules. So when water goes from ice to regular water, do the H2O molecules start to break down? No, just the bonds that hold them together start to break down. Right? It's still water. Just like when you bring it to a boil, what happens there? Yeah, there's steam, right? It becomes that um, kind of vaporous state. So it's still water, but it's now 
individual molecules, right? Those bonds have been broken. So when we go from a solid to a liquid, the particles that have been held tightly now are starting to break, right? They've, they've been held tightly by this, what we call intermolecular forces, or you'll see me label these as just IM forces. Okay, I don't want to write out that whole word, so if you want to put that little note in your notes, you can. Okay, usually I'll just label them IM forces because I don't want to write out the whole word. Um, but these solid particles are held together by something, right? It has to be these intermolecular forces that help hold them together, okay? Energy is what we use to break down these molecular forces, okay? So usually in the form of heat, those bonds can be broken. What else can it be besides heat? Um, like some sort of a force or something like that. Like if it's a piece of something brittle, you could shatter it. That would also break those bonds. So this is the connection basically between melting point and boiling point, right, and these intermolecular forces. So if I've got something that's got a really, really high melting point, what does that mean in terms of the energy that's required? It's a greater amount of energy that's required to break those bonds. So a melting point is the point at which those solid particles start to become a liquid. So if I have a high melting point, that means it requires a lot of energy to break those bonds, which means it has really strong intermolecular forces. Okay, do we see the whole process that goes in there? Okay, so the higher the melting point or even the higher the boiling point, right, going from a liquid to a gas, that means that it's got a really, really strong intermolecular forces. So that would be like if it's more dense, it would be harder to... Typically, typically. Density has something to do with it. Not always, but... That's a pretty good assumption. Okay, let's look at some boiling point values on page 204. So grab your textbook real quick. This is the strongest type of intermolecular force. It's called a hydrogen bond. Okay, it's so strong that we call it a bond, even though it's not a bond. Okay. You can write down a shortened version of this definition. Okay, you don't have to write the whole thing. But go ahead and get reading through that and think about what it means. This definition is a lot of words that are big, okay? So write down a shortened version or your own version, and I'll explain what that definition really means. Depiction down here of this drawing, because it does make a good um, viewing of what's happening here. Here's an oxygen um, surrounded by two hydrogens. What is that molecule? Water. Good, it's water. And what do we know about water? Does it have any lone pairs? What? Yes. Yes. Got two lone pairs. <laughs> it's bent. It's got to have two lone pairs. Okay? So, this hydrogen right here on the end of this molecule kind of has a little bit of a partial positive charge. And we're going to talk about that um, more specifically in a second. But this is kind of hanging out with a little positive charge. Because between oxygen and hydrogen, which of those is more electronegative? Oxygen. That means the electrons within this covalent bond are going to shade their way kind of towards oxygen. Does that make sense? Oxygen's pulling them a little bit tighter. So hydrogen kind of has a little bit of a po positive charge here. These two electrons probably have what type of a little charge? Negative, because they are electrons. Okay? So this lone pair right here is given off a little bit of a negative charge. This hydrogen is given off a little bit of a positive charge, which is where this hydrogen bond forms. Okay? It's a really just a really strong attraction. It's not a true bond. There's no trading of electrons that goes on. It's not a true complete bond, but we call it a hydrogen bond because it's a very strong attraction. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are not truly a bond. They are just an attraction between two atoms. Okay, if you see it on um, paper, usually hydrogen bonds are going to be represented by a dotted line like you see here. Okay, so it means it's not truly a bond, but it is really holding those two things together pretty tightly.
Okay, so this causes molecules that contain hydrogen to have a pretty high boiling point. Okay, because hydrogen bonds are the strongest type of intermolecular forces. So it, it makes these type of atoms or these type of molecules have pretty high boiling points because it takes a lot of energy to break that hydrogen bond. We're going to talk about called a London dispersion force. Okay, and these are the weaker intermolecular force. We're really only going to talk about two. These are the weaker. Okay, and they are intermolecular attractions resulting from the constant <coughs> motion of electrons and the creation of what we consider instantaneous dipoles. I'll talk about what a dipole here is in, in a little bit. What you need to know about these London dispersion forces is that they are very weak. Weak, weak, weak. Okay, and you can shorten all this information up, right? They occur between all atoms, all molecules. Um, they are the only forces that act between nonpolar molecules and noble gas atoms. Okay, so these London dispersion forces are present in every single type of molecule. Okay, in every single type of group of molecules, I mean. Okay, every single um, group of molecules has what we call these London dispersion forces. And you'll, they have a different name. I don't know why they have two names. But they're also called Van der Waals. Oops. Two A's. They're called Van der Waal forces. Assuming that's the guy that came up with them, I don't know that. Okay, you don't have to know both names. I just might accidentally say this because this is how I was taught it. Okay, London dispersion is what your book calls it. Okay, and I'll try to stick with that name. But if I accidentally slip, that's what um, another name for them. Okay, so you see as you get bigger molecules that contain more electrons and that have a greater molar mass, you'll see stronger London forces. Chapter 6. This is our last little portion of Chapter 6, and it takes everything we've done so far and puts it into one. Okay? Everything we've done puts it into one single thing. So let's look at a little... Listen. Let's review uh, what it means to be a polar bond or a nonpolar bond. Okay? Can somebody give me an example of what a polar bond means? Usually it's in a covalent molecule, which means what happens to the electrons? They're shared. Okay, so in a polar bond, are the electrons shared evenly or unevenly? Unevenly. 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 <laughs> or it's backwards, right? Polar means they're shared unevenly. Nonpolar means they are shared evenly. Okay? <sighs> okay. So, polar when they are shared unevenly. So, now we, we looked at polar bonds and nonpolar bonds, but now we're looking at the molecule as a whole. Okay, so when is a molecule considered polar? It's when we have something called a dipole moment. Sounds dramatic, right? A dipole moment. Okay. So there's a couple things that tell us when a molecule is considered polar. One of them is when it has a dipole moment, right, when we have opposite charges. And basically, a good clue for that is when we have an asymmetrical molecule. Um, we see that forming within a molecule as a whole, not just individual bonds. So now we're looking at a whole molecule. Let's look at an easy one to begin with, and let's start with HCl. What are you guys doing? All right, so if I have my Lewis structure for HCl, it's very simple. 
right? That's what it should look like. Which of those atoms is more electronegative? Chlorine, right? Chlorine is really electronegative. It's really close to fluorine. So that means in this bond, are the electrons more on the chlorine side or more on the hydrogen side? Chlorine. More on the chlorine side. So what happens here is we have what we call a dipole moment because these electrons are not shared evenly. So what happens is when we want to show that dipole moment, we're going to draw a little arrow in the direction of the negativity. Right? We're drawing an arrow in the direction the electrons would be going. So another way to remember this is this is the positive side, this is the negative side. Okay? That's why we draw the little positive on the end of the arrow. Positive side of the, ad, of the molecule, negative side of the molecule. That's what a dipole moment is telling us that. This is where the electrons are kind of shaded in this molecule. Okay, they're located most of the time, um, you know, wherever the arrow is pointing to. Okay? Mm -hmm. So will you, like, ask them... Try some more examples here. Let's try water. 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 We've seen the Lewis structure for water several times. So this should be one that you almost have memorized by now. And the lone pairs, yes, it has lone pairs. <laughs> when, if you have lone pairs on top and bottom, that's no good. If you have lone pairs on the top and bottom, that's no good because that doesn't really show us the shape it really is. Right? We know it's bent, so let's draw it like that. Okay? So... When we determine if a molecule is polar or not, we have to start looking at the bonds. So in these bonds, do we think they're polar or nonpolar? They are, they are polar, right? Electrons between hydrogen and oxygen are not shared evenly. Which direction do they go? Toward oxygen. They go toward oxygen. Okay, so that means within these individual bonds, they're each pointing toward hydrogen. I'm sorry, toward oxygen, I said that backward. Okay, those electrons are being pulled toward oxygen. So our total dipole moment for the whole molecule, where would that be going? Up. Up. Right? You don't have to draw these little mini arrows if you don't want to, but it does kind of show us where the electrons are located. That's what this dipole moment arrow kind of does for us. <coughs> it tells us where are the electrons located in this molecule most of the time. And in this case, they're going straight up. Right, here's the positive side. It contains both of those hydrogens. Here's the negative side. Okay, how do we feel about polarity? So now we're looking at CCL4. If we look at a bond between chlorine and carbon, is it pointing, which way are the electrons being pulled? Toward carbon or toward chlorine? Chlorine. Chlorine, okay. So for each of those bonds, we would see them being pulled toward chlorine. So are they being pulled evenly in each direction? Yes, right? So these just cancel each other out. Right? If they're being pulled top to bottom evenly and side to side evenly, those get canceled out, right? So is this molecule polar or nonpolar? Non nonpolar, good. Another good trick to remember is this molecule is symmetric. Symmetric molecules are nonpolar, right? Because they're always going to be pulling evenly. Okay, symmetric if they're... Um, if, they're being, if electrons are being pulled with equal magnitude in different directions, we would consider, consider that a nonpolar molecule. Uh -huh. Will it happen for like Which of those is more electronegative? Chlorine. This is an ionic mono molecule, so there's really no um, definite dipole moment, but I wanted you to see the big difference in electronegativity. Right? This is an ionic molecule, so really there's a total trade happening. But if we wanted to look at the complete um, pull of electrons, it's going to go toward chlorine. Okay. What other questions do we have? 
Yeah. 